Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, blessing us beyond measure. Thank you that uh, we can come here today, that we can uh, join together as a family in your name. Thank you that we get the gift of music to uh, honor you with. God, I pray that, that we would have our hearts and minds aligned today to focus directly on you and not external things and things that are going on in the world and things that are going on outside these four walls. But this, just for this brief time, we don't focus on, on what's going on out there, but we solely focus on you, eyes on Jesus entirely. God, I pray that once we leave here, that we get our eyes continuously on you, but also on what's going on in the world, also on people that need to know you, people that don't know you. Help us to be the hands and feet of the living God. I pray that we would also, along with being the hands and feet of the living God, I pray, Jesus, that you would help us, help us to be salt and light, to flavor the environment around us and expose the truth of, of our great God. But for this time right now, for this time right now, help us, Holy Spirit, to get ourselves just solely focused on you in the worship of you and the adoration of you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
fills me up with joy that I may sing in my peace. Thank you evermore and praise you evermore. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and
Father, we thank you so much for allowing us the privilege to worship you with your gift of music. We thank you that you've given us this great place to meet with this awesome family of uh, followers of Jesus, seeking truth, seeking um, a higher standard spiritually than what the world has to offer. We thank you that we can come here and study your word without any kind of fear of, of well, what, fear of anything, really. And we thank you that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but one of sound mind. So we can listen to this lesson today, this message today, ingest it, and let it be your, the word of God become part of who we are, not just something that we read or that we study or that we intellectually dissect, but something that literally becomes a part of us and propels us forward more and more into the image of God. Thank you, Jesus, for all of that. Thank you for rescuing us from the cross as we just sang the wondrous cross in which the prince of glory died my richest gain my worldly gain I count as loss and per cont contempt on all my pride Lord Jesus we know that pride is probably the one thing we can trace every single sin back to pride every single one Lord I pray that you would help us to remain humble and help us to, re to remain servants of the Most High God. Help us to remain in a mindset when we, we study this lesson that, you know, if there's something we disagree with, that we can discuss it at the, at the end and not just toss away the whole lesson because there's one little thing that maybe, maybe we disagree with. But God, I pray that you would be not only the Lord of this time we have here today, but also the Lord of our discussions. I pray more importantly that you're the, the Lord of Mark's lesson today as he brings the part two of the lesson from last week. More importantly, importantly than that, I pray that you would be not just the savior of every person in this room, but the Lord of every person in this room. Help us to let go of the things that we're holding on to. I don't think there's a single person in this room that, that can say that they've let go of every single thing. So help us to let go of every single area of our lives, every bit of pride, every bit of thing that we're holding on to that we think that we can do it better or that we think that we've got it all figured out. Help us to be open to the idea today, Jesus, that you're the one that's got it figured out. You're the one that figured it out. You're the one that paid a, a penalty that I, I know I couldn't afford it. Even if I would have sacrificed my life, to, to gain eternity. My sacrifice wasn't good enough to do it, but yours was. Help us to press into this better way, this, this new thing, the new thing that's coming to us all the time in your word. Help us to, to get focused on that and focused on you. And then when we leave here, you know, it's so easy to be a Christian inside these four walls. We leave here, it's not as easy. But Jesus, I pray that you would give us the, the gumption to do that, that you would birth in us this desire to represent Jesus in everything that we do and everywhere we go. So with all that said, I pray that we don't hear Mark today. I pray that we hear the word of the living God today. I pray that Mark disappears and we hear you. I mean, I know we can't really ignore Mark. That's impossible. We all know that. <laughs> but... We also know that the word of God is so powerful and so big and so strong and so important that our spirits need to ingest that. You've gotten us past the, the, the milk stage and you've got us now onto the meat stage. So God, help us to chew it up, to swallow it, ingest it, and let it become part of who we are as a people. I pray all this in the mighty, holy, precious in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I, I used to be taller. So. <laughs> okay, well, except for the veiled fat joke, uh, uh, half of what uh, Sean prayed in, oh, it's, a, uh, it's hard to ignore, Mark. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. Uh, a good deal of what he prayed is in the lesson today. So you got a little foreshadow. Okay, so we have been going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And it's been, you know, uh, really fun, right? No, it's been, it's been enjoyable. It's been blessing, but it's not, not been happy clappy. So uh, here we go. We're in Mark 8, 36 to 38. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Okay, some of you were here last week, some of you weren't. Uh, if you were here last week, you remember that on Super Bowl Sunday, just before Valentine's Day, we talked about Jesus telling his disciples and the 12, the apostles, that they should deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. And yes, as you can imagine, it was a hilarious time. Uh, we discussed at length the gospel is not a comfortable message. Okay? In fact, C.S. Lewis says that if you're looking for a comfortable religion, he certainly does not recommend Christianity. It's true. It's comforting. It ain't comfortable, okay? You get uh, the gospel is very comforting, but it does require that you step out of your comfort zone and go down paths that are out of your comfort zone, out of your wheelhouse a bit, okay? It's not about the American dream with a nice house, nice lawn, nice picket fence filled with ease and leisure, okay? That's a lie. Because this world hates us. This world hates us. It hates us because it first hated Jesus. And if they persecuted him, they will promise, will persecute us. Even Jesus' own family rejected him. You'll remember, okay? They said he was great, great, right? Okay? Now, we need to be in the world but not of the world, okay? We need to be salt and light to the lost. That was in your first prayer, okay? And the thought continues here because we start with the word for. So as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, we then proceed to the next concept here. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Let's just say for the hypothetical scenario that the whole Stinking world is what you get. You get the whole stinking world, okay? Let's just say you get the whole shemir. And hear me now, this is exactly what many people in power are literally after, okay? People in politics, people in big tech, people in big pharma, big oil, military, military industrial complex, United Nations, the whole thing. What do they want? They want power and control power and control. Isn't that exactly what Jesus was offered by Satan? Just kneel and it'll all be yours. No need for the sacrifice. That's what he offers the ambitious power and control. And of course, there are some people who say, oh, if I had the power, I'd be very noble. I'd be a selfless dictator. I'd use my position to help people. I wouldn't lose my soul, right? Okay, yeah, that's the lie he tells us when he offers us power. No, it's the other guy that's going to be the greedy despot, right? No, it's never us. I would bring about utopia, right? Sure you would. Sure you would. Because guess what? If you kiss the ring of Satan, you are of the world. And that means you are part of that kingdom, part of that system, part of that statue from Daniel chapter 2. You know, the one with the head of gold? 
And the uh, arms and chest of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron mixed with clay, okay, that represents all these world systems in Babylon, right? The one that's blown to smithereens by the rock that was cut without hands, which is the after everlasting kingdom. There is a different outcome for those who call upon the rock, not Dwayne Johnson, the real rock, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lion of Judah. And it's amazing to me how many people who belong to the world will squabble, stamp, trample, bite, claw like customers on Black Friday to get what they think is going to be a price break on a very coveted piece of plastic for power and control. You can kind of get what these people are after when they're politicians, okay? Although this whole thing last week of the Emperor of Canada, that just seems a little silly to me. Declare martial law and arrest people who are bringing food and gasoline, freeze bank accounts because how dare someone disagree with my policies and politics, you swastika-waving deplorables. Power and control. Isn't that what the kingpin in prison wants? Power and control. The bully in the schoolyard. Power and control. The bullies on the Board of Education who strike out in righteous fury. How dare you question what we do with your children? Power and control. The tech programmer who now gets to throw fact checks at people and ban accounts. Power and control. The St. Louis District Attorney who fabricates evidence in order to win a state election. Power and control. The pharmacist who suddenly has a little power over those doctors who want to prescribe medicine as they see fit. Power and control. All these petty little kings on their petty little hills, how quickly they sell their souls for St. Louis, for a seat on the bench, for Canada. This is what the world is. This is how the world operates. And if we are chasing these golden carrots at the cost of our own souls, what do you think we're doing? Verse 37, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will you give to exchange your soul? What do we actually take with us in the end? Stuff? That piece of plastic we body checked Auntie on, on Black Friday at Walmart? Taking any of that? Rank? Position? How about our standing in community? Do we really think that'll matter when we die? What is, your, what is worth your soul? Maybe I need to, need to ask, what is your soul worth? What does God consider it worth? What did God offer to redeem your souls? It wasn't cheap. Even if we treat it as such, because we are so accustomed to being in the world that we start to feel at home here. It amazes me in my own life when I look at my own battle with lust and pornography, what bits of my own soul I was willing to barter for the illusion of some pretty young woman's body. That I have entertained that sort of behavior for pleasures that last for a vapor's breath of time, at the cost of staining my soul with images that grieve my Lord and Savior, at the distortion of his beautiful gift, remember God invented sex, his beautiful gift of physical intimacy between a husband and a wife. It disgusts me. It bears a price on me. But thank the Lord God that this price was paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. I used to really struggle with why I always felt like I never belonged anywhere, and now I'm glad I feel that way. I'm glad I feel like I don't belong because I'm not part of the kingdom of this world. I'm part of his kingdom. I've tried to make the world like me. They're just not going to. Only my thoughts need redemption too. My habits need redemption. I need to reread Romans 12, 1 to 2, especially that need for me 
not to conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It's the reasonable response to the price he paid, isn't it? Let's read the whole thing. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, which mercies? The ones applied to us. I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you, I think is in the King James, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It's the reasonable response to the price he paid. No? Okay. This living sacrifice, notice it says it's holy. Now, holy is a word with a lot of baggage in our society. We think it means glowing with ethereal and mystic power. Okay, like it's Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Okay. Uh, and only pay, you, know, you can only lift it up if you're worthy, if you've been found worthy. That means you have to be either Thor or the Vision or Captain America, or Natalie Portman. Sorry for the spoiler. Uh, but that's not what holy means, okay? <laughs> holy means set apart. Set apart. Reserved. What's a reserve when you're making a, a, pr a product and a reserve? That's the one set apart, or set apart for something special. It's of higher quality. We're the redeemed one. It's about his worth, the redeemer. We deny ourselves and we stand with his cross. That's what baptism is, isn't it? We are identifying with it. It's the, 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 the picture of being buried. You're buried in the water and then you rise up a new creature. Okay. Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed. We're back in uh, Mark. Uh, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, that sounds like a lot of Bible words, okay? But it's talking about the cross, right? The world finds the cross offensive. Did you know that? The world finds it offensive. Why? Because I don't need saving. How dare you think I need saving? Some of us in this room know people who have left the world, let the world shame them because of him. And they decided to walk away from the faith and assimilate to the world. They walked away from the faith because they were ashamed at what his word says. Not what people say it says, what it actually says. <coughs> they don't want the blowback that the world shoots at them for standing on biblical truth. And so the American church business model has, by and large, responded by no longer declaring his word, but watering down the message of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, and embraced philosophies and doctrines of the world in order to get a bitter, bigger and better market share on, his, on the available sheep. Okay? It's essentially become ethical therapeutic deism. Now that... To those of us who have been redeemed, that should be deeply offensive to us because too much was paid. Too much was paid to water that down, to dumb down the message into something useless, something namby-pamby. Now, we see this phrase, adulterous and sinful generation. Okay, It's very easy to read right through that yada, 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 adulterous and sinful generation. Okay. It's Bible talk, right? Okay, let's break it down a bit. I'm not going to bore you with the Greek words. You can look those up on your own time. Okay, adulterous. In the Greek, we kind of get a sense of unfaithful, yeah, from the, from the English translation. But adulterous in the Bible also refers to spiritual adultery, which is idolatry, right? And again, it's not worshiping just statues, although it kind of blows my mind how much of that actually goes on in 2022. How many people are actually physically bowing down to a statue? It's become in vogue again. 
okay. <laughs> Spiritual adultery is when we have made a covenant with God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ, right? Clothed in His righteousness. And then we whore ourselves to something or someone else. That's, yeah, we, we kind of step on toes here. That is spiritual adultery. The word sinful seems pretty obvious, but I looked it up anyway, just to be careful, okay? And it has the idea of being fully given over to sin, aggressive, aggressively and passionately sinful, a zealot for sin. And generation, this is one that usually gets uh, mistranslated. It's not like, you know, millennials, boomers, Gen X. That's not, that's not what it's talking about. It's the idea of a family, a people, but also a culture, and also the context of an age. So we could rephrase this according to the Greek, because it's written in Greek, not in English. This idolatrous age given over zealously to sin. A little more clear now? That culture sounds remarkably familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Why are we surprised when the world acts like the world, okay? <laughs> so what's the promise here? We always want to talk about the, well, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And those are great promises, but there are other promises here. What's the promise here? If we will not stand with him and his word, then he will not stand with us. Wow, okay. There is no sitting on the fence in the kingdom of God. There's no third category, okay? You are either on team Jesus or you're on team world. There is no neutrality. Right now, the world is being very aggressive toward people who are not on team world. And I guarantee you that while they will give overtures to woo you, We've seen the loyalty of the world. They throw you under the bus the instant you break ranks with the world in any detail whatsoever. Jude says it this way. For some men who were designated for this judgment long ago has come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying Jesus our Christ, our only master and Lord. These are wolves in sheep's clothing. Clothing. They were never on Team Jesus. They have infiltrated Team Jesus in order to create confusion and chaos. I don't know if you know that this happens. There are certain cults that will come. They will find a small congregation, and they will infiltrate that congregation with enough of their people, and then they take it over. And then they go way off the rails. It's a premeditated technique, okay? They start subtle. Oh, we're, we're, we're not saying that the Bible isn't God's word. We're just saying that the text has been corrupted over the centuries by corrupt relig religious leaders. Really? What's your, what's, your, what's your evidence on that? Oh, well, well, we have a special on the History Channel, you know. Okay, and you watch it, and you're watching critically, and they have absolutely nothing but speculation and distortion. So it's all hype, and they got nothing. Zip. Zero. Nada. Then they start rewriting the Bible or airbrushing bits out of that the world finds, you know, offensive. You ever notice that the world gets offensive? It gets offended a lot. They always call us the touchy ones, but they're the ones that keep getting offended, right? Okay. Okay. Hell. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, hell needs to go. Yeah, really. So if there's no hell, well, what, what do we need a savior for? What are we being saved from? Well, you're, you're being saved from, you know, uh, uh, religious intolerance. See, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, okay. Because uh, when I read, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. And I and the Father are one. And you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. I mean, that one made the high priest rip his robe. That was his way of going, I have decided the matter, and I'm ruining this perfectly good robe to prove my point. Okay, that's a specific claiming to be God. And the re religious rulers of the day got that message crystal clear. 
Okay? If Jesus never claimed to be God, they would not have plotted to kill him. This culture has all sorts of ideas, and they don't really make sense. Okay, let's take one. This is a worldly idea. Moral relativity. Well, you have your morality, and I have mine. Okay? Play that out. Unless you contradict their morality, then all of a sudden they become moral absolutists ready to burn you at the stake. 2 Timothy 4 says this. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead? Is that a mere man? Is that just a good teacher? That's God himself. Okay. At his appearing and his kingdom, whose kingdom? Yeah, Jesus Christ. Okay. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. When you're speaking the truth, and that makes you radical, you're in a culture that does not value truth at all. When these wool-covered wolves get all these ears itching and get others to turn away from the truth and turn aside to fables, how do you think they're planning on treating those who stand for the truth? Are they a tolerable, honorable sort? Are they the live and let live type of people? No, that's what they want you to do with them. But mark my words, they will not do that to you. Is that what we see today? Or rather, do we see that Monty Python villager who's saying, burn them, burn them. You know, from the Holy Grail. Yeah, what do we do with witches? Burn them, yeah. And I promise you, they're not going to see if you weigh the same as a duck. Okay, they're going to start looking more and more and more like Salem Witch Trials, Communist China, North Korea, Boko Haram. Even in this general part of the world, the world is starting to ignore the law regarding religious conviction, religious exemptions, and they're getting bolder and bolder about shutting churches down. Now, I don't say this to be an alarmist. This should be no surprise. I don't say this to, well, we have to fight to protect our rights. Really? Do they have that out all everywhere else in the world? Uphold the law, that's one thing. But politics isn't solving anything. Do we really, think, did, did Jesus teach that we can, we can stand for the truth without any consequences? No. What did he say? So this, none of this should be any surprise. In fact, there's a part in the Bible where Paul says, don't, don't be surprised. Maybe it's Paul, maybe it's James. Chris, you know, where he says, do not be surprised when you encounter all kinds of trouble. Yeah, it sounds like James. Yeah, yeah, okay. The world is the world. And as we talked about last week, there are no lo we are no longer enjoying cultural dominance and prosperity these days, okay? We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Eyes on Jesus, not on the circumstances, not on the storms, but on Jesus. So that we are watchful in all things, enduring all things. Enduring all things. What endures all things? 1 Corinthians 13, love endures all things. Okay, So we're walking in love. Does that mean we're attacking people that attack us? No. That's how the world does it. We're to be different. We are to do what to those who curse us? Bless those who curse us. Love our enemies. Who else is doing that? Be the first to start a trend. Okay? So, we're watchful in all things, enduring all things. We are not getting our priorities out of proportion and distorted by the culture around us. Okay? 
We're called to be salt and light, to walk in love and compassion, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the lives of our brethren and in the lives of the lost. But we cannot do that. We cannot do that without a daily walk with him, without constantly holding on to his word and conforming our lives to his love by the Holy Spirit. If you were to run a marriage the way most Christians in this country run their faith, do you think they're going to be married in two years? No. Why? Well, I gave you an hour on Sunday. What are you complaining about? Oh, no, I'm done. The hour's over. I've got to watch my game now. Okay. We cannot walk in the spirit if we are playing footsie with the world. The world is going to offer you a place, just like that addiction that, if I may quote my own song, that acts like that flirty girl telling pretty lies till she has you wrapped around her finger, and then she plays you for a fool. Because if you don't belong to the world, if you belong to Jesus, that girl is never going to love you, and she never will. Because that girl is at war with Jesus that addiction, that whatever hang-up you've got that's not of God, does not love you, says she loves you, she doesn't. The world, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're very inclusive, unless you disagree, and then they burn you at the stake. We need to not be that way. We need not to conform ourselves to pundits, to politics, we need to conform ourselves to Jesus Christ. How many people know Jesus' politics? You know why? Because politics ruins everything. That's why. What's the point? What is the point? What is the problem with this country? Top to bottom, we need to repent. The rich people, they're doing, they're the ones buying off senators and stuff like that to make laws that profit them that don't profit us. The poor people are wanting something for nothing. They're the ones stealing papers off the porches. The middle class, well, I, you know, how many of them care more about their lawn than they do about their neighbor? Ouch. Yeah. So what are we supposed to do? Daily walk. What makes a good marriage? Talk, constantly talk. If you're in the same room, and is God in the room? I didn't hear you. Yes. There we go. God's in the room. So acknowledge him in the room. That's something I'm, I'm going to try and do. My boys might think I'm a little cray-cray but uh, if I keep talking to God while they're in the room. But he is in the room, right? So let's normalize bringing God into the conversation as a participant, not just referencing him, talking about him as if he's not here. When people talk about you, when you're in the room, as if you're not in the room, how's that feel? So why do we do it to God? So we need to start doing that with each other. We reach out to people, not in order to get more co people to come to the gathering. The gathering doesn't save anybody. Who saves? Jesus saves. Now, what we've tried to do here is strip away all the garbage that's not even in the Bible that people put onto church, okay? Now, if other people have that, well, whatever. Take people the way they're at. Take, take people where they're at. Isn't that what Jesus did? Okay? But we love them enough, just like Jesus. Don't We love them enough not to leave them there, right? So first, we, we get the vertical going. We pray. We go, I never hear from God. You have 66 books all in one cover. You can know he has a lot to say. 66 books. How many people here have written 66 books? He has a lot to say. We could open it up and see what he has to say. People say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Do you have kids? Oh, well, yeah. Well, then he, there's a whole lot on what, what he wants you to do if you have kids. One of your main things. What is a man's first ministry? To his wife. Pastors, they're going, oh, sorry, hon, you have to take one for the... No, that's out of order. First, you get your house in order. Then you come. 
and then go and do likewise. What's James say? He says, uh, if this, I didn't have this down because this is not in my notes, but um, he says, what, what's it like when you hear the word, but then you don't do the word? That's like a, a guy at sea, and he has no rudder, and he's just tossed about. I think that's uh, James 1 something and something. That's one of my favorite things, James 1 something and something. Yeah. <laughs> it's toward the end of that chapter. She's looking, she's looking. Double man divided in all he does because he's got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of heaven. Are we waiting or? Good, I'll keep going. Okay. <laughs> so we get that vertical going and then we go horizontal. And we, there again, if we're not taking care of our brothers in church, is the world going to take care of us? Yeah, here we go. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That's self deception. Why? It's professing one thing and doing another. That's deception. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word, oops, yeah, there we go is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror for he looks at himself, goes away, and right away forgets what kind of man he is. You know why I wear this? I mean, it's kind of cool looking, but I wear it to remind me of which kingdom I belong to. It's not for other people to, oh, look, he must be some guy because he has a, a fish around his neck. No, that's for me. Because I like... I'm like Darren says, I, I'm a laugh for I like to get people to laugh. And I might be tempted to say things that don't honor God in order to get that laugh. I might be tempted to, to get into something like that. I might be tempted to make try and make other people think that I'm smarter than I actually am. Okay, This reminds me of which kingdom I'm supposed to be focusing on. Not trying to get people to like me. Not even trying to get people to like Jesus, but just to hear. Because you know what? If they don't have the Spirit of God, if they're not called, they're going to reject it. But if they are going to hear it, they might reject it seven, eight times before they finally break down because they're resisting. What, what do they say in Acts? It's like it is hard to kick against the goads, okay, because you've got that thing that's stabbing. I don't know. I can't, I'm, I'm not done playing around yet. And it's like, really? Really? You want to play around with the garbage? You want to play around in the muck? I don't want to spend a single minute of my life outside the will of God. Now, that's a cute thing to say in front of a bunch of people. Way harder to live. Am I there? Not on your life. Not on your life. I'm in recovery, okay? In recovery for addiction to lust. That's a rough one. I need to own it. I need to be real with people, be transparent with people. And then what happens with that? If I'm transparent with that, I'm wearing it around my neck. Am I approachable? Okay. And if I'm approachable, then they're not going to see this big finger here. They're going to see when I say, you need to repent, there's the implied along with me. Instead of, well, you need to repent. That kind of sounds like the people that come to church and they go, well, they see someone who's not a Christian, and they go, well, I'm forgiven. You're going to hell. That's not Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, how I would have gathered you under my wings like a hen to her chicks, but you would not. We need to be that reaching out because who else is going to do it? Anybody? Who else? So let's start doing it. But we got to get our own house in order first. We got to get the vertical, then we got to get the horizontal, and then we can go out the other half. Lord, thank you for this very uncomfortable message. Forgive us for seeking comfortable constantly in this culture. We want air conditioning. We want heating. We want cushions. We want the, the 
the music be loud but not too loud. We want it to be this way. We want it to be that way. And we're so focused on our desires instead of your agenda. Lord, help us to be on your agenda. Can we get the musicians back up here?
You deserve all glory, all honor. You deserve the praises of your people. You say that you inhabit those praises. It's where you dwell in the praises of your people. Lord Jesus, create in us a desire to build a mansion of praise when we gather together. Not just play some cute songs, but to, to build a dwelling place that you inhabit. Let your temples, us, that the Holy Spirit dwells in, build a praise mansion praise castle for our King Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you've given us this word today, and, and as Mark delineated this, this separation between getting eyes on Jesus and eyes on the things of the world, whether it be politics, whether it be, geez, even our own wives and our families and our jobs and our cares and our worries and our concerns and our fears. All of those things separate us from you. Jesus, I pray that as our king, that you would wield your sword against those things. When we're not strong enough, when we're, we don't have the ability to, to let go, we pray that you would just rip those things out of us. We've already submitted to King Jesus, but help us to let go further. We're not people, people of the world who have not submitted to you yet. We're people who have submitted to you, yet still holding on to remnants of things that we really should be letting go of anyway. One of them, I think, is our, our fear of worshiping with abandon. Jesus, have your way. 